Welcome back, everybody. My name is Ali Misre. I'm faculty here at ANTU. And uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Jackie Ying. Professor Ying is executive director of the Institute of Bioengineering and Nanotechnology. And she leads a world-class team that pursue cutting-edge interdisciplinary research bridging science, engineering, and medicine. Professor Ying has been, named one of, has been named one of the 100 engineers of the modern era by the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. Her research is interdisciplinary in nature with a theme in the synthesis of advanced nanostructure materials for catalytic and biomaterial application. Today, Professor Ying will talk to us about nanocomposite design of advanced biomaterials for various applications such as bioimaging, biosensing, diagnostic, and drug screening. I now invite Professor Ying to join me on the stage. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here. I want to start by thanking the organizers for this uh, opportunity to speak to all of you. Uh, Molecular Frontiers is a very unique organization that reaches out to young people over the world in the interest of uh, getting all of you excited about science and research. So today, uh, NTU um, really has uh, done a great job bringing everybody together. I actually grew up on this campus between the age of seven and uh, 15, my father was a professor here, and so it's really a pleasure to be back in this campus. Okay. So today what I'd like to do is to describe to you about nanotechnology, uh, the enabling tool for 21st century. Okay. So may I can, can I have the first slide? <laughs> okay. So nanotechnology, I'm sure many of you have heard about it. Today, I would just like to share some perspective on how we are trying to develop this toolbox for future use. Okay? In particular, I'd like to share a ex very unique experience that I had a few years ago um, working in this uh, Blue Ribbon uh, Committee that looks at the grand challenges for the 21st century. This was organized by the National Academy of Engineering. In particular, you can see that we identify 14 areas whereby uh, we have grand challenges for engineering to make a difference on the sustainability of our current lifestyle, right? uh, health of the people, vulnerability issues, as well as joy of living. So this, is, I think, is a very interesting uh, report, and I encourage all of you to look it up on the website. Okay? In particular, there's a few things that are very close to our heart. For example, in terms of impacting health, we are looking at developing nano devices for early diagnosis of diseases. Okay? We're looking at the creating nano medicine, which has better ways of treating various diseases. Okay? We're looking at developing nanoporous materials in the form of membranes so that they can allow us to have greater access to clean water. So the first two items impact the health, and this item, clean water, is really important to the sustainability of civilization. The next area is dealing with greenhouse gases. Many of you know about the global warming effect. We have too much CO2 that is emitted to the atmosphere. How do we sequester them and better still make use of them? Basically, it will involve the development of new nano catalysts. And last but not least, in a country like Singapore, we have plenty of solar power. Right? How do we harness this as a useful form of energy and make it economical? We'll rely very much on creating nanocomposite systems. So let me start by giving you an example. We face a number of infectious diseases. Every year, we have various different problems. Okay? So if you recall, a couple of years ago, we were looking at H1N1 as a major spread of infectious diseases. So in molecular diagnostics, it has a major role to play in being able to detect these diseases early on to prevent the spread of these diseases to create any epidemics and pandemics. So this is a major market that we're trying to tackle. And one of the major bottlenecks for detection of diseases basically lie in the area of being able to extract the sample and then detect it rapidly. Okay? 
So the biosample preparation and analysis goes through various different steps. For example, first you have a tissue and cell lysis. And from there you extract the DNA, RNA and protein. You then need to amplify the signal in order to detect it. Okay? So this basically involves various different steps. It's very tedious. In fact, requires usually six to eight hours. And in the process, you might introduce contamination to the sample, or you might subject the operator to the disease. Okay? So what we like to do is to avoid all that tedious process, use a closed system that involves a tiny miniaturized device, which we call microkit. So in this microkit, basically it involves two parts. One part is a test cartridge that is made of plastic, so it's very inexpensive. It allows us to do the various different lab operations within a little um, cartridge that, for example, allows us to do RNA, DNA extraction. And then, once the sample is extracted, okay, through the different chambers that does the lab operation, we can bring this sample into a system which will allow us to do this polymerized chain reaction. Okay. So this detection process then take place within a system that is in a box this big. Okay? So it's smaller than your laser printer and can be put on top of benches and can be operated easily. Okay? We have a process that will do this sample preparation and detection in less than two hours. So it greatly cuts down the time for the entire process. It's in this polymer cartridge that is less than $1, so it's very inexpensive. And the compact desktop system can be used not only in major hospitals, but also in clinics and better still in checkpoints like airports. So that when people come in through during the season where people are suspected of catching any infectious diseases, can go through this check and they can be isolated instead of spreading the disease to the community. So we have developed this approach to successfully um, detect and type and subtype different types of uh, influenza. Okay? So you can detect specifically H1N1 from other types of seasonal flu. The same type of device can also be used to detect other types of diseases. Okay? And we are in the process of commercializing this technology through an IBN spin-off called SG Molecular Diagnostics. Okay? Another type of things that we can make a difference to the healthcare of our society is not only in diagnosis of diseases, in the early detection of diseases, but in better treatment through nanomedicine. Okay? So many of you are familiar with drug delivery systems. These drug delivery systems basically are made of uh, typically polymers that will encapsulate the active ingredients of the drugs. Okay? And then slowly, this material, polymer, will degrade through hydrolysis. And as the material degrades, it will release this active ingredient. Okay? So this type of approach has been used very often in your pills. Okay? You allow for a constant or exponential release of the drug over time. So sometimes you can take this medicine uh, just a few times a day instead of every other hour. Okay? And some better ones can take only once a day instead of uh, several times a day. Okay? And more sophisticated approaches have also been developed in more recent years whereby they make use of materials that will encapsulate these drugs and it will swell due to changes in pH or temperature. And as it swell, then the ingredients will be released. This is very important because many of you probably know that cancer cells and tumors have a lower pH. So you can develop this material to use it to target those cancerous cells and tumors instead of creating a systemic side effect to other healthy cells and tissues. Okay. What I'd like to give you an example of for this nanomedicine doesn't involve these two types of methods whereby you have a control release, but rather in what we call a stimuli-responsive release. Okay. So many of you probably know of people who suffer from diabetes. Right? So after a good meal like what we had just now, you will have to prick your fingertips. Right? This part, you can draw blood easily, but it's also very painful because there are lots of nerves here. Right? You draw your blood and then you test 
what is the blood sugar level. If it's high, you then have to inject yourself with insulin. Okay? As you can imagine, this is met with very poor patient compliance because people don't like to go through these painful processes. So as a result, a lot of diabetic patients are not properly treated. They go through um, different types of uh, episodes whereby it damages all the different types of organs in the body. And even some people who religiously test their blood sugar level, what they find is when they inject themselves insulin, the blood sugar level will drop very drastically. Okay? So you have this a high and low blood sugar level goes through in this person's body. And again, this creates a lot of problem in damaging the different organs. So what we would like to do is to bypass that process to develop a new material that will allow us to release the insulin only when the blood sugar level is high. Okay? So in other words, create a system that will mimic the physiological secretion of insulin so that insulin will only be delivered when the blood sugar level is high. Okay? So this requires us to create a material, in particular a polymer, that is glucose sensitive. Okay? So in this polymer, it has two parts. One is con A, or a material that has a glucose binding site as a protein. And the other component is basically a polymer that contains glucosyl groups, such as dextrin. Okay? So when these two materials come together, they form a cross-linked polymer and it can encapsulate the drug. So when there are free glucose in the bloodstream, when the blood glucose level is high, that free glucose will compete with the polymeric glucose for the glucose binding site on con A. So what will happen is the originally cross-linked polymer will fall apart gradually from the outside to the inside. And as it falls apart, the active ingredient, insulin, will be released. Okay? So what we did is we used this material to encapsulate insulin, and we also used different type of materials to protect this system to allow for oral or nasal delivery. So in other words, you no longer need to inject insulin. You can just take it in. Okay? And the insulin will be released only when the blood sugar level is high. Okay? The formulation of this material through nanotechnology is a critical step because the nanoparticles basically allow us to allow this system be in circulation for extended period of time without being picked up by the immune system by uh, macrophage digestion because they're so tiny. Okay? Secondly, the small particle allow us to have a very high systemic absorption and bioavailability. Okay? So what we see is that this system goes on in circulation in the body standard period of time, it will basically not release any insulin when the blood sugar level is low or normal. Okay? You just have a basal uh, release of insulin, like what the pancreas do. But when the blood sugar level is high, notice how the insulin will be rapidly released. Okay? And when the blood sugar level drops, again, it will stop releasing. Okay? This is illustrated in the in vivo study that we had conducted with diabetic rats. For these diabetic rats, they were induced by injection of STZ. They start out with very high blood sugar level. And when they're taking this new medicine, and this nano medicine, you see the blood sugar level will drop to the normal level. And then depending on how much dosage is administered, you can actually keep the blood sugar level normal for extended period of time if you introduce triple amount of dosage. Those of you familiar with insulin, if you have injected yourself with three times the amount, you will basically go into unconsciousness. You will have a hypoglycemic episode. However, with this system, if you introduce more, it will just be in blood circulation for extended period of time and used only when it's needed. Okay? So this system was first developed by me and my graduate student back at MIT. We then created a startup company called Smart Cells in, 19, uh, in 2003, okay, right before I came to Singapore. In the last uh, seven years or so, we went through large animal studies and preclinical trials. And then the companies become very excited before it enters clinical trial. Two companies wanted to bring a small company out. One company 
be another. In the end, it was bought out by Merck for 500 million US dollars. Right? I want to impress upon you, not that that student has become so rich from this deal, never have to work again, but rather the impact of this new technology. Right? Why does a company worth so much? It's because it will create a new drug that will greatly improve the patient's um, compliance to the medication and also, also their quality of life. Okay? So we hope Merck will bring it to, through clinical trial and bring this to market. Another example I'd like to give to you involves developing heart tissues. Okay? There are different kinds of tissue in our body. Some are soft and some are hard. Bone tissues are basically what we consider as a heart tissue. Okay? They are very important because when they need to be regenerated, people typically make use of different kinds of grafts. They are in short supply, creates infection problems. And when people use artificial scaffolds, they typically make use of ceramic or metal systems. And sometimes they also use titanium-based alloys. Okay? So if you think about our body, we don't have all these foreign materials. Titanium alloy especially is one of the things that will create a lot of wear and tear, a lot of debris in the body with surrounding tissue. They're incompatible basically because they have different mechanical properties and different types of pore structure from our surrounding bone. So what we want to do is to learn from nature. Right? The other example I told you, how we try to learn from nature to deliver insulin only when it's needed. This example, we are trying to learn from nature by looking at our physiology. The bone is basically made up of collagen matrix with hydroxyapatite nanocrystals. These hydroxyapatite nanocrystals are very important because the combination of these two materials gives our bone a lot of ductility. So when we are young, we have nanocrystals. And when we are older, we have micron-sized crystals, and our bone lose the ductility. So young people, when they, fall down, they don't break a bone, but old people can crack a bone very easily. Okay? So we learned from nature, we basically created a collagen matrix for our tissue scaffold, and then we synthetically make nanocrystalline hydroxyapatite, which are basically calcium phosphate materials. We process them in such a way that they have an architecture similar to natural bone, besides having the right chemical composition. Okay? So this is what our nanofoam scaffold looks like. It is highly porous and it has a higher archical structure. The nanometer-sized pores are important for protein absorption. Micron-sized pores are important for blood vessels to grow through them for vascularization. And the very large pores are important for cells to proliferate and to migrate. Okay? So in our bone, we have this very interesting hierarchical structure, which is illustrated here. And we were able to mimic this in our, natural, in our nanofoam. Okay? So we, when we create a defect in a bone, we create a, a critical size defect, it will not heal by itself after five months. Okay? So this is in an animal, in a rat femur, if you use one of the best material out there that's commercially available, like Beck and Dickinson's material, what you see is that there is partial healing, but there's also inflammation around the surrounding um, implant. Okay? Where else, if you introduce our material, the material will slowly get resolved and the new bone will get formed and deposited. Okay? So within five months, the bone will completely be healed. So this is the type of things that we are trying to do, and we are now pushing it through large animal studies in Singapore. Okay. Another example involves a very complicated organ in our body. And here, what we are trying to do is to look at whether there are better ways to do uh, kidney uh, functions. For kidney, it basically has a number of different major components. It's a very complicated um, organ whereby you have the glomerulus, which does the hemofiltration. Okay. You also have the proximal tubules, okay, which does the reabsorption of nutrients like glucose, amino acids, etc. Okay. It also is involved in the secretion of creatinine, uric acid, and it produces vitamin D. 
so when we do normal hemodialysis for people with kidney failure, they only do, hemo, they only do the uh, blood filtration. It means that they filter out the toxin in the blood as well as all the good nutrients. Okay? When we want to present a better solution to these uh, um, kidney patients, what we try to create is a biomimetic uh, kidney device, okay? which has two components. It not only has a hemodialysis component, whereby you filter out the albumin, urea, and creatinine in the first part. More importantly, in the second part, we have a cartridge for reabsorption of nutrients. And in this second cartridge, it is a lot more complicated than just filtering out molecules, but it actually has a very nice monolayer of renal tubule cells. Okay? It is important that in this renal tubule monolayer that there is no leakage, so that only the nutrients get reabsorbed through it. Okay? And so the material has to be a porous non-fouling membrane, and it has to be biocompatible, allowing us to deposit a suitable type of coating, for example, involving extracellular materials, to sustain the formation of this differentiated epithelial with water channel expression, typical of kidney tubules. Next, we have to extract out uh, this um, material in the form of membranes um, as hollow fibers. So we develop a very e interesting method for extruding this material along with the cells so that the fibers are lined with these important tubule cells. Okay? This technology has led to not only uh, kidney assist devices that I just described, but it can also be used for other important applications. I mentioned sustainability. In this world, there are many people have bad access, poor access to drinkable water. Okay? So drinking water is a very major uh, problem. And what we want to do is to develop a membrane technology that will allow us to purify water. Okay? So with very sophisticated membrane technology that I just described, this will allow us to easily purify water with this nanoporous membrane and then also allow us potentially to do treatment of seawater and wastewater. Okay. Another area that is important in sustainability is to how to deal with all the greenhouse gases that we have that is out there creating global warming. Okay. In particular, I'm talking about CO2. There is 5,500 million tons of carbon basically emitted every year, causing global warming. Okay, so this is a major problem. We want to not only sequester the CO2, but utilize them as a cheap and sustainable feedstock. Okay. So we have developed nanocalus that will allow us to reduce CO2 to a green fuel like methanol. Methanol can be used to power cars. This is now widely tested in China, for example. And the market is huge. Okay. So this callus that we have developed is a carbene callus that is an organocallus. So this is very important because prior to our work, people have been using organometallic callus that is not only expensive, but has problems in dealing with um, presence of oxygen and water. And of course, we know in the, when there is CO2, there's going to be water and there's going to be oxygen. Right? So those callus really do not work for practical applications. By using our organocallus, we bypass those problems. And this callus also is very efficient. It will work at room temperature with very high yield compared to conventional callus that are very slow and require high temperatures. The other thing that we did was to look at how we can make use of CO2 to convert it to various pharmaceuticals and chemicals. So again, using callus, we have developed methods that we can convert it to poly propionic acid and acrylic acid. These are very important chemicals using our petrochemical industry as well as in a materials industry as polymers. So we hope that this new callus in the form of nanocallus, because we can easily turn this into a main chain carbene callus as a polymer, we can use them again and again by easily filtering them out against other gas phase or liquid phase uh, reactions. And we can use this system to develop green technology for making chemicals and pharmaceuticals, besides uh, sequestering and utilizing greenhouse gases.
And last but not least, we would like to talk briefly about energy applications. Hmm, something happened here. Um, in here, what we are talking about is instead of organic nanoparticles, we are developing various different kinds of inorganic nanoparticles for energy applications. You can see that these callus have very interesting uh, characteristics. They're all tiny on the scale of several nanometers. So for example, you can have the inside as a platinum, the, as, a, as, a, as a cage, you can have the bell, uh, sorry, as a platinum, we, and ruthenium, we can have the bell cage catalyst. We can involve semiconductor quantum dots and metals, and we can have things that like gold decorated on the semiconductor or have necklace-like catalysts. And what this does is it allows us to mix different kinds of metals, semiconductors, and also oxides with very unique size-dependent properties from these nanocatalysts, and then we can disperse them in such a way that they have interesting synergistic and electric between them. And this allows us to basically harness them for very, very high activity in catalytic reactions, along with uh, superior selectivity and efficiency. So this type of catalyst, what we're trying to do is to make use of them to efficiently convert and store energy, for example, in fuel cells, in solar cells, and also in advanced batteries. Okay. So what I have uh, done today is hopefully give you a snapshot of what we are trying to do with our nanotechnology toolbox. Okay? At the Institute of Bioengineering and Nanotechnology, we are basically creating this nano toolbox for a variety of applications. For healthcare impact, we're trying to develop uh, new medicines in the form of drug and protein delivery and tissue engineering and implants. We're trying to create nanomaterials and micro devices for bioimaging sensing and medical devices for diagnostic of uh, diseases so that we can treat these diseases at an early stage. Okay? In addition, with creating nanocalus, they can allow us to have green chemistry for pharmaceutical synthesis as well as uh, chemical processing. And last but not least, we are creating all kinds of nanocomposite structures that will allow us to have um, materials that will harness uh, and convert energy in a green form. So all in all, what we're trying to do is create this toolbox that can allow us to have very complex systems designed in the way that we handle the challenges of the 21st century. Okay. Last but not least, I'd like to mention to all of you that there are many different pathways in Singapore whereby we can reach out and nurture our young people to pursue scientific career in research. Our Agency for Science, Technology and Research has been nurturing uh, young talents in research. In fact, we have now a thousand local PhD students in the pipeline, and many of them are uh, either pursuing their studies locally and overseas for their bachelor, PhD, and postdoc training, and some of them have already come back and been deployed in our research institutes as well as at the universities. Okay? We hope that you will consider these various different scholarships. And also in our institute, we have an outreach program for the young people, and here we are organizing these activities for open houses, seminars, and workshops. We have reached out to more than 54,000 students as well as teachers in the last nine years. And many students are also applying for our youth attachment program, whereby we basically will have about 200 students attached to us every year for a period of at least one month doing experiments and research in our institute. Many of them have gone on to win various different uh, awards for science and technology fairs, both in Singapore and also overseas. Okay. So I'd like to encourage you to look at our webpage and apply to our youth research program to gain more research experience. Okay. Last but not least, let me acknowledge my co-workers uh, for the work um, led by um, our team in the micro kit. And i also like to mention Danny Zink for the work on the kidney um, assist device that we have been collaborating on, and with Yigen Zhang on the work involving CO2 conversion. And we are grateful for the funding from the Institute of Bioengineering and Nanotechnology, which is part of the Agency for Science, Technology, and Research. Thank you very much for your attention.